WMPG thrives with support from listeners and from Maine Solar Solutions. Maine Solar Solutions, helping empower homeowners and businesses with solar electric solutions for 10 years. Information at mainesolarsolutions.com. You're listening to WMPG 90.9 Gorham Portland, Southern Maine Community Radio from USM. Live from the Orion Cygnus arm of the Milky Way Galaxy, this is Scientifically Speaking, a weekly half-hour program devoted to elegant curiosities, and I am one of your hosts, Sarah Chang, and joining me, as always, is Bernie Rhyme, DJ Star Watcher. How are you, Bernie? Yes, I'm Sarah. Very good. Thank you. Bernie is our professor of the Astronomy Lab here at USM and our local protector of the night skies. Reach out to us at WMPG Scientifically Speaking at gmail.com or on Twitter at WMPG Sci Speak, and you can head over to WMPG.org to find the last five weeks of archives of all of your favorite shows, including this one. Bernie, could you let our listeners know what is up in the night sky for this coming week? Yes, yeah, certainly. So this will be Friday, August 19th. So basically that will be a waning crescent moon. Uh, we had the last quarter of the day before, so that means it would be rising around midnight and setting around noontime. Um, Saturn is actually up now before it even gets dark. Saturn was at opposition on the 14th, so it'll be up as soon as it gets dark enough. And then Jupiter's probably rising around 10 and Mars around midnight. So those are the planets that were all lined up in order uh, a couple months ago. Um, then you might still see a few leftover Perseids. Of course, they peaked on the 12th, but the moon was full. So actually, I didn't see any Perseids, but you can still see a few of them floating around there. Uh, so the days are getting shorter. We only have a month to go to fall. The sunrise is 5.49 a.m. and it's setting at 7.40, so just under 14 hours already for the daylight. Um, so, and oh yeah, in exactly 10 days from now, we might launch the Artemis 1 mission back to the moon. Ooh. A couple different launch windows and one of them in just 10 days. There's not going to be any people, just some mannequins to do some tests. The people are going to go up in 2024 in May, and then hopefully we'll land with the third, the Artemis 3 mission. You can look for all kinds of neat things coming up soon. Wait, are they using, they're actually using mannequins? Yeah, they're going to be three mannequins with all kinds of, you know, uh, things, sensors put on them so they get some oh. sense of what they're doing. They're testing the Orion capsule, which I, I actually had a chance to be in that in the Johnson Space Center. Six astronauts can sit in that, not the little crowded three at the Apollo, stuff like that. <laughs> but the Gemini, obviously, that's only for two people. Yeah. So it's like luxury transit. Yeah, exactly. All luxury, yep. Ma or mass transit. Closer to mass transit. <laughs> yeah, pretty soon, any of us can probably go. I think gonna, they have a regular citizen. I think a Japanese person going to the moon fairly soon. Oh, nice. A few extra hundred million, but, you know, it's getting more, more affordable. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you, Bernie. Not you welcome. And if you couldn't take notes fast enough, you can check out the monthly What's Up column in the Portland Press Herald. So welcome to another episode here on Scientifically Speaking. Today's show, we have a special guest, Stephen Grimsley. Welcome. Hello, how are you? <laughs> um, Stephen, I, I had the pleasure of meeting over at Stellafane, which happened the end of July, end of July, right? Yeah. Um, it's the end of July in um, Springfield, Vermont. And um, one of our former guests, Peter Gillette, He's part of the Vermont Astronomical Society. And so that was uh, how I met Stephen was Peter was like, hey, go check out what he's doing. He's doing some really cool imaging. And so it's like midnight. I couldn't even see who you were. I just showed up and uh, was like, what are you doing? And you kind of showed me what you're doing and um, taking a really cool image. I, it took a while. Um, but, uh, yeah. And so I asked you to be on our show and welcome to the show. Well, it's, it's a pleasure being here. Um, Stephen, would you mind just kind of briefly introducing yourself to, to our listeners and kind of what, um, what got you into astronomy? What got you into astrophotography? Well, I grew up in rural Virginia and uh, my grandparents had a farm and at night there were no, there's no light pollution or anything. And I would just be looking at the stars and the planets. And it was just really fascinating. And I always liked science. Um, I went to Virginia Tech and studied uh, uh, geology and geophysics. And uh, the irony is, is that I spent most of my life, my working life, um, uh, using um, geophysical instruments to go and explore underneath of the ground. Um, 
And uh, now that I'm retired, I can just swap ends and just go ahead and uh, look in the sky like I've always wanted to. <laughs> it's a little easier. You don't have to dig or anything like that to look at the night sky. Well, yeah, it's uh, the, what you need. Um, clouds didn't get in the way of, of geophysics. Uh, oh, that's true. Time, but, uh, <laughs> but it certainly gets clouds and rain and weather certainly get in the way of looking at. But, uh, that's very true. And you can't do anything about those. From the well, ground. I still go to Texas twice a year because I, I spent most of my working life in Texas. And there's the Texas Star Party and the El Dorado Star Party out in Western Texas. So I get out there in the, in the high desert and uh and take images as well and that's where oh, i've got wow. most of my images cellophane is a relatively new star party for me oh nice nice well welcome to our main audience here <laughs> all right for today's show we we've bernie at least has been kind of inserting snippets about james webb and what um what the telescope has been up to you know it's the mischievous James Webb Telescope. Um, and, uh, you know, it's over at L2 right now. Um, it's been there for a couple months now. And um, it has, there have been some stunning images released by the James Webb Space Telescope. And we haven't really formally um, talked about them on the show. And um, when, when Stephen was sharing his images with me, I was like, I mean, a lot of the images that I saw there, I was like blown away. But his images were like, whoa, this is like Hubble quality. I mean, it could even be James Webb <laughs> quality, but um, you know, that's totally different resolution. So we, um, we want to talk a little bit about James Webb, um, what it's up to. We, we did a whole thing on James Webb a couple months ago, but it was more about, you know, how it's going to get there. It was pre launch and everything. Uh, but now that it's been up there and we have some news and information from it, um, we thought we'd do kind of an overview and also talk about kind of James Webb versus Hubble and, um, and talk a little bit about what, um, Steven does. I don't know, do you do this like full time now? Or I guess you do it half time because it's only night half time, half the time. But <laughs> you probably do process and, and do a lot of work in this and you clearly love this. So, um, and so we'll talk a little bit about how, um, about all of that. So James Webb, um, I wanted to kick off this conversation by um, just going over the four main goals of James Webb Space Telescope. And um, they're pretty basic, but this comes from NASA. And basically, the, the four goals of James, the James Webb Space Telescope are to one, to search for light from the first stars and galaxies that formed in the universe after the Big Bang. Two, to study galaxy formation and evolution. Three, to understand star formation and planet formation. And then four, to study planetary systems and the origins of life. So that is, that is what the James Webb Space Telescope is meant to do. And they said it was only going to be, technically its life was not going to be that long, but it has been, it has been engineered to outlast. I don't, I don't even remember what the lifespan was supposed to be. It's not that long. It's like five it's or 10. It's supposed to be only like five years and now yeah. it's going to go 20. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's yeah. Like this life is dependent upon the fuel that it has because right. it has to be positioned properly yeah. and the deployment was so efficient that it had much more fuel left over than what was anticipated and that's given it extra life oh yeah i mean from an engineering perspective i was just meeting with an another engineering friend of mine and we were just like gawking about how like seamless <laughs> the launch and and everything was like for all the millions of parts um just an engineering marvel so those are the goals that was the lifespan it should last much longer um so what is up with the james webb telescope what is it what has it been up to lately well it's a different telescope in design than the hubble because it's an infrared scope and one of the reasons why they positioned it where they did was one because it's a stable position that keeps it uh, pretty much in the same uh, position with respect to the earth um, during the entire uh, revolution around the sun. Um, but it's an infrared telescope, which means it's looking at a spectrum that's actually lower than, uh, than the Hubble. Um, you can still see images from it because they can just go ahead and, and you can go and print images from infrared because it's, it's electromagnetic light, just like uh, the visual spectrum is. Mm. 
but in infrared, it has to be very cold. And so they mm -hmm. had to get it far enough away from Earth and also the moon uh, for to keep it cold. And also that's why the sun shield was so important because they mm -hmm. have to, because infrared basically is heat. So they have to cut down on the noise. So that's why it's necessary to go and get it very cold. Um, yeah, that temperature difference is crazy. It's going to be um, like negative 200 something or whatever on one side. And the, the sun side is like, I don't even remember what the temperature is. 130 and over minus 400 on the. Oh, oh. minus 400. Yeah. It, it, it's, the same, it's the same as with the moon and it's the same as with mercury. Uh, the backside of mercury fair. is extremely cold. If you don't yeah. have an insulating atmosphere, um, and then it would just it will disperse its heat just like uh, the law of thermodynamics says it's going to um yeah. so uh, no, that that's a very good point because our highs and lows are like 50 and 70. <laughs> not much <yeah. laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and then on venus the uh, highs and lows are less than a degree apart and this uh, uh whether it's facing the sun or away from the sun where the equatorial region and the polar region is within a degree in the and uh, percentage-wise, it's pretty minor considering it's uh, over 800 degrees on Venus. It's a one yeah. the greenhouse effect. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's such a, wow, that's a good one. I never like, really thought about that. I mean, we know about our atmosphere and how great it is, but um, so we should all be grateful for that. <laughs> well, we have an analog for greenhouse effect right next door, so we need to go and use that to, uh, in our uh, yeah. As yeah. A model for our own. Yeah. So Bernie, you did a little bit of um, looking into what else the yeah. James Webb has been up to. Mm -hmm. What what kind of what kind of things have he been well, doing? We briefly reviewed the first five images that came out with all these live conferences from NASA and everything. Mm -hmm. That was amazing enough. But now almost every additional image is getting even more amazing. Yeah. So they're getting the furthest distant stars, the furthest galaxies, the oldest galaxies. So they had gotten back to 330 million years after the Big Bang. Then he got one at 300 million years. And now they just found one only 235 million years after the start of the universe. So they're almost starting to question maybe some of the theories because these are fully formed galaxies full of billions of stars just after the dark ages when supposedly nothing could have formed yet in the universe. So mm -hmm. there's some really amazing stuff that's probably going to rewrite all the textbooks. So that's one thing. And the latest image is of the Cartwheel Galaxy. Now the Hubble took the Cartwheel. It's basically a kind of a strange galaxy. It's lenticular. It's a half a billion light years away in the constellation of Sculptor. It looks like a giant firework or a bicycle spoke. And so now they're seeing that, of course, in infrared. So it has a really bright core. And because infrared looks through dust, they can see it a lot better because it was very mm -hmm. dusty. Uh, it has a bright core. And then uh, these rings going out and tons and like millions of stars are being formed in these rings. Usually there's not that many stars forming in a galaxy. So that's going to be really neat, and they're learning a lot more about that. And, and just the shape of it and how it looks and the colors they can put in. And so that's the latest. To cut. But every image is further and more amazing than the one before it. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, there, so kind of on that cartwheel, um, mm -hmm. one of the images I saw was that uh, they were, they kind of had it split where, you know, the first half was what the Hubble took. So same image, but... Hubble took it and then the 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 other half was James Webb taking it and so um uh Stephen you had mentioned that the James Webb telescope is different because it's it's an infrared telescope um how how do you think like do you think that the James Webb telescope is kind of um a successor or kind of like a replacement for Hubble because that image is clearer but it is also different um it looks quite different well the answer to your question is yes in both cases because it is a successor to hubble because hubble has basically just about been decommissioned it's mm -hmm. just simply run its life um you can get deep sky images uh with the james webb um as mentioned in the infrared spectrum um you can see through clouds as what has already been mentioned um and uh, and you can see further back towards the uh, towards the early stages of the universe because mm -hmm. since the universe has been expanding, the lights that that's left those sources has been stretched by the expansion of the universe. So what was visible light or even um, ultraviolet um, at its source billions upon billions of years ago 
has now been stretched to the infrared. So that's the only, that's the spectrum that you can see it in. Mm. Both the James Webb and the Hubble are spectroscopes so that they go and, and collect spectra um, and from the spectra, they can go and figure out what the elemental compositions are of these of these objects, which is uh, incredibly important. Yeah, it's going to be a dumb question because um, you mentioned one of the advantages of the infrared is that you can see through clouds. Through some clouds. Some That's clouds. True. Yeah. What kind of clouds can you not see through? Um. I don't know that I have a good answer for that, but uh, let's just say that the bigger the dust particles, probably the the more difficult it is to go and penetrate those. So, gotcha. um, but um, I, I'm I guess I'm not in that bet, uh, a good of a position to answer that. There's still some areas that are obscured, but I mm -hmm. think that they're fairly minor as compared to what we were dealing with with Hubble. Right, right. Um, and Hubble was just visual spectrum, right? Mostly, it did go down into the high infrared and the low ultraviolet, but it was mostly visual. It was basically a, uh, it was a mirror telescope, just like the ones that we have on Earth. And um, it just got above the atmosphere. And, um, and uh, uh, that was uh, just getting away from the atmospheric effects, which really obscure imaging um, images uh, was just incredibly important. Yeah. Hmm. So, because you're you of your experience in astrophotography and probably with like lenses and all the types, um, could you potentially have an a UV telescope, like one that images in UV light? Well, the problem with UV is that uh, it would have well, yeah, from space you can, and we do have uh, uh, ultraviolet telescopes, I believe, in space. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't researched it lately, um, but from the surface, infrared is filtered by the atmosphere and, um, and ultraviolet is uh, filtered by the ozone, which is pretty important or else uh, you'd get uh, sunburned in a matter of just a, a less than a minute if you didn't go and have that, uh, the ozone layer in the upper Earth's atmosphere going in and knocking that down. So, um, so the atmosphere basically is the limiting factor for surface telescopes. And uh, for infrared and ultraviolet, that is, uh, those are two parts of the spectrum that, um, that are, are compromised by the atmosphere. Very cool. Okay, let's, let's go back to kind of the work that you do in, in photography. Um, you have, so you take a lot of beautiful objects of, uh, beautiful images of deep sky objects. Um, could you talk a little bit about your process? It's, it's obviously very different from James Weber, or it could actually not be that different, but yeah. Could you talk a little bit about that process? Well, the important thing, uh, with any astro imaging is that you have to go and gather data on very faint objects, which means that you have to have long exposure times, long data gathering times. And to do that, you need stability. If you remember when you were walking around my telescope, I was telling you to just kind of be careful. Don't hit any of the wires. Um, uh, I was knocking everything down, kicking things. <laughs> no, you, you were not, but it's because I was on you all the time. Um, so uh, I was in, in, in that just because I do it too. I mean, I kick the leg of my telescope sometimes by accident and then I have to go and do a realignment. <laughs> you have to get these long exposure times, which means that you have to have the camera open for long periods of time and the sky is uh, is moving, where it's moving with respect to us because the earth is rotating and you have to go and center on an object and you have to have for very, very precise tracking mm -hmm. and very good focus. And that's basically the key to any good astro imaging is to have extremely good focus and extremely good tracking so that you could take the long time exposures um, and, uh, and then stacking them, digitally stacking different, uh, uh, different um, frames, uh, you mitigate noise. So, so that's, how, that's how these things look better. I mean, they look like they do in the scope, but they just look better because they're brighter and there's a lot, a lot less noise involved. So if you were able to get in line to control the James Webb Space Telescope and take some images. Um, 
first um when you're when you're taking images you know from from down here on earth how long would it take for you mm, roughly if you really wanted a good image of um let's just say the ring nebula I generally take about an hour and 15 minutes to an hour and 30 minutes of exposure time. Um, and uh, of course, uh, the thing about it is there's not a whole lot of image overlap between what I'm doing and what James Webb would do because James Webb has so much more capability mm -hmm. than any other scope uh, on that in existence really, mm -hmm. um, that you wanna spend time on targets that, um, that really would advance science, not yeah. these close-in targets that I'm doing. I can yeah. do deep field as well, but the deep field for me is a lot different than deep field for James Webb or even Hubble for that matter. Yeah. So I guess, um, and I don't know if either of you know this answer, but if, if the James Webb were to take kind of a similar in, um, as far as like in distance object to like what you're taking on here on earth, would it be kind of a quick image or would it be also like an hour and a half? I'm not sure about that because I've never operated the James Webb. Um, I would think with the F, well, F ratio, I don't know the F ratio of the James Webb and the F ratio basically tells you the speed of your scope just like it does with the speed of your camera, um, uh, which is the focus of aperture and image scale. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, I'm looking at um, 92 millimeters to um, to 155 millimeters. Those are my two scopes. And James Webb is what? 6.5 meters. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's 21 feet. Five meters. I mean, it has millions of times the aperture that I have. Um, so, uh, but the, if its f ratio is f7, like what I shoot at. It's, it's going to be a similar amount of time. It's just that the image scale of James Webb would just be so much more right. significant than what I have. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the physics work the same. Um, uh, it's just that, uh, uh, you know, James Webb is above the atmosphere and it's, it's just so much larger. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I don't know. I haven't uh, looked at what the parameters are that, that, of the James Webb images. I, I really haven't looked at how long that they're taking um yeah on these images well, i can answer some of that f ratio is 20.2 okay long f. and when they took the deep field image that was 12 hours but it was way better than 10 days on the hubble oh, so wow. normally its images won't be 12 hours but in 12 hours it could do way more than the hubble could do in 10 days yeah, but that's because that's because the hubble was orbiting in low earth orbit and the james webb is out there uh orbiting the sun yeah, so the period happen. of the, the the period of the orbit is just so different. That's why the James Webb can stay on target for um, uh, so much more efficiently. Yeah. Yeah. So twenty point two f ratio. It's pretty pretty long. F but it's actually slower than my uh, than my te uh, telescope. But as mentioned, it takes a much bigger image scale. Yeah. So um, so uh, um, and that's why you can see so much more detail. In right. It. Right. It's not quite apples to apples, but no, I thought that was a really good analysis though. <laughs> um, and so uh, one of the things that you've kind of talked about, um, or we've talked about Hubble a little bit, um, that seems like a little bit closer comparison to what you know you maybe are able to do here. And have you compared some of the objects that you may have taken that the Hubble has also taken? and? How do those? I've done it a couple of times, um, uh, but I don't make a regular effort at, at that. It's not a competition. <laughs> yeah, it's not a competition. And, and I mean, Hubble is the size of a school bus, and, and, <laughs> and my scope, as I said, is just it's just a little over three and a half inches for my small scope, and a little over six inches for my big scope. So, uh, so it, it's it's. <laughs> It's a different ballpark. I mean, yeah. um, so um, um, there's not really much else I could say. I can put them side by side, and you can see that they're the same objects. Yeah. And uh, um, and mine are pretty good, but uh, but you know, goodness gracious, uh, uh, I mean, um, it's like it's, it's 
it's like if I went to play tennis with Venus Williams, I mean, I would just would just get wiped out. I mean, it's just it's no comparison. Oh man, I think everybody was like, "Wow, this person needs to go away." Talking about me because every image was like, "Wow, that is Hubble quality." And they're like, "No, no, no." I haven't I... Seen that much. I've got a lot more to say than I'm going to just just uh, just so that you can. Uh, uh, see what we're able to do. The cameras have gotten so much better. That's the main thing. Yeah, yeah. The cameras are better, mm -hmm. and um, and the optics are, are, are the optics have gotten better too. Because I use refractors, and of course the space telescopes are reflectors for for different reasons. But uh, um, but anyway, uh, I have to say that the, the refractor telescopes that I use are made in the United States. They're made in Rockford, Illinois, from a from a master optician, and. Um, and so uh, um, one of the things I did want to go and mention that's different between my images and uh, Hubble and also James Webb is that you don't see those spikes on bright stars. When you see those spikes, that's actually an artifact of the telescope, a mm -hmm. refractor telescope without any, uh, anything in the way, just a clear lens, um, doesn't have that. So uh. those spikes are not natural. I mean, they're, they're, they're kind of uh, ornamental, uh, they're kind of pretty, um, but but that's an artifact of the actual telescope itself. Yeah, no, that's that's a good point. Um, pretty much, I think the deep field one. I remember there was like a very bright, you know, kind of your typical how you would draw a star shape. Um, and yeah, I think the cartwheel one does too. So that's a that's a good little tidbit. The fainter stars, you don't, you won't see those because there yeah. just isn't that much light scattered mm -hmm. from the actual telescope that will form those. It's on the brightest stars that that's most noticeable. Interesting. Um, and so, Stephen, just um, kind of out of curiosity of your work, how long have you been doing um, astrophotography? Well, I let's put it this way: the better question, the better answer to this question is, how long have I been doing astrophotography very well? <laughs> it's not really, nearly as long because I, I started uh, when we were still doing film, uh, hypersensitized oh, film, wow. and before we had auto guiders, um, mm -hmm. at least before I had an auto guider. So I was trying to manually guide film shots, and, and that was an extremely tedious and difficult process to get anything uh, good in it at all. Digital cameras came out in 2006, and that's when I got my first one, my first commercial one. And that's that's when I that's when the thing started looking much 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 better. Mm. Uh, all the old material that I had before then is is unless it's not able to reproduce it, um, uh, it's just a few images, and and I just scan those to make them digital. But the digital cameras have revolutionized everything, and um, I don't even know there are that many people that remember the old film cameras that, uh, that used to be out there. And um, what is it about? Um kind of imaging objects in the night sky that keeps you going back for more? I like to see transients. Um, mm -hmm. I like to see the universe in motion. I have done um, uh, eclipse. I, I mean, I, I do deep skies, most of it, but I have done eclipses and also transits. Transits, of course, are when Mercury goes in front of the sun and when Venus goes in front of the sun. I'll send you a couple of uh, uh, copies of those. And I have done uh, lunar eclipses and solar eclipses. And it's just really neat to actually see things in motion in your telescope, to see the shadow move across the moon, to see the planet move across the face of the sun. Um, and uh, uh, I mean, we, we, we think that we live, everything's nice and stable and we're sitting still and nothing else is moving, but everything is moving all the time, everything. Right. I mean, we're on a pretty fast spaceship ourselves. Yes. Uh, um, and uh, it's good that it's in a nice stable orbit, that it's everything <laughs> nice and nice and, and comfortable uh, for the most part. But uh, uh, but anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. My last question for you, Stephen, is because you mentioned eclipses. Where will you be in 2024 in April? I plan to be where it's clear. That's where I plan to be. <laughs> Anywhere it's clear. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I went to Nebraska for the last total solar eclipse that uh, that was really in uh, a major one that crossed the continental United States. And, of course, the uh, center line for it is going to be here in northern Vermont, 
but it's going to be on April 8th. And, you know, I don't know what our chances are for clear skies um, at that point. So you just have to look at the long range, range weather and, um, and uh, uh, head to where it's, where it's good. I mean, it's going to start in, in Mexico and then in Texas and come all the way across the country. So, um, uh, so we'll just have to see. We shall see. Well, Stephen, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciated your insights and your willingness to share your work in astrophotography. Okay, you're very welcome. And I'm going to send you a little bit more for you to see. You've been listening to Scientifically Speaking here on WMPG 90.9 with myself, Bernie, and Stephen. Stay tuned for something for the weekend with Anella. And from your favorite nerds, don't forget to look up. You don't know what you've been missing. <laughs>